Joining us now, I'd like to welcome our last speaker for today's program, Rick Matthews. Rick is a partner in our intellectual property section based out of our Raleigh office. He focuses his practice on intellectual property matters, including patent, trademark, copyright, trade secret, licensing, and related litigation. He has extensive experience handling every aspect of litigation through trial and appeal. Rick, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Lauren. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I'm going to talk about patent troll laws, and that's the pejorative term for non-practicing entities that assert patents and don't make or use any of the uh, goods or services protected by the patents. And so if we'll, we can begin, um, I'm going to cover three different so issues, if you will, one is the state abuse of patent assertion acts that have been act enacted by a number of states to help defend against and thwart these patent troll assertions. I'm going to talk about some recent cases that we've been watching and paying attention to that are relevant for this field. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some takeaways that uh, practitioners can utilize to help both defend against patent assertion entities and to uh, better strategize to avoid such demands by these patent trolls. So I'll begin with the state-based abuse of patent assertion acts. These are a relatively new um, body of law enacted by a number of states. Um, as I mentioned earlier, non-practicing entities are, again, the pejorative patent trolls or entities that own patents and assert these patents, but they do not perform any act under what's called 35 U.S.C. Section 271 of the Code. So that's Section 271 of the Patent Act that provides for infringement if there is any making, using, selling, offering to sell, or importing of an infringing article. So usually we run into patent trolls or non-practicing entities that are just shell companies, often formed with investors and attorneys, and they cost the U.S. economy $29 billion in legal costs each year. Um, they use very aggressive tactics. They send demand letters, often with high licensing fees, but yet low enough that it doesn't make sense to litigate these cases. Um, and it's often a barrage of letters that are sent out by these patent trolls a man demanding similar uh, monetary recoupment from each potential target, as we did de de describe them. Um, Vermont was the first state to enact an abusive patent assertion law in 2013, targeting what are bad faith assertions. And I'll get into the, the definition of that term in a moment, but that was first um, utilized in the Vermont versus MPHJ tech investment case that went to the federal circuit. And interestingly enough, in that case, it, MPH was uh, known to have targeted 16,000 plus small companies. So this was part of the um, e effort and motivation, if you will, to enact these state-based uh, acts that thwart or at least help thwart patent assertion entities from uh, bullying their small uh, targets. North Carolina came after with its own act, passed in 2014, uh, a year later. It largely mirrors Vermont's law, um, but it has some, some differences, some beneficial differences, in fact. Um, but as a whole, the act, uh, the North Carolina Abuse of Patent Assertion Act, falls under Chapter 75 of the North Carolina General Statutes. And that is the unfair competition law. So it's, you know, threatening or unfair and deceptive trade practice like acts that the North Carolina General Assembly has already uh, taken action on and enacted quite a number of laws to help defend against such acts. And the North Carolina Act has several advantages, as I alluded to, uh, including um, doubling a bond provision to $500,000 and adding joinder provisions so that you can bring in not just the patent troll itself, but any principals or investors and others that are involved in this bad faith assertion of 
patent infringement. So anyone that has been targeted by a baseless assertion of patent infringement can bring either a suit on its own or a counterclaim in an existing patent infringement act. Uh, in North Carolina, the act provides that the attorney, attorney general may also join the act under 75-145. Um, again, I, I mentioned the bond requirement that uh, provides at least a bond at the outset or at least in an early portion of the case up to $500,000. And then the remedy is for a successful party asserting the North Carolina Abuse of Patent Assertion Act is to recover all compensatory damages, costs and fees, which naturally include attorney's fees and exemplary damages of either $50,000 or three th times the total amount of the damage, whichever is greater. So in most instances, patent infringement is an expensive gambit, and those fees will far exceed the $50,000 uh, floor, if you will. Um, and so the North Carolina Act itself has remedies for potential targets, I define a target as someone that's received a letter or received a threat, to thwart or at least counter these uh, bad faith assertions. So that brings up the question, what's a bad faith assertion? The act itself provides a list of factors, and they're non-exclusive factors, but 75-143, uh, um, the first factor is the demand does not contain all of the following information. So a patent application or patent number, the name and address of the, the patent owner or assignee, specific factual allegations concerning which of the pro products, services, or technology that infringe. And that's um, a particular factual accusation that, at least in the patent world that I live in, includes a claim chart. Um, 1D provides that at least an explanation, if the uh, um, person asserting the patent isn't the owner or the assignee, an explanation for why that entity has standing to assert uh, that patent. So a target wouldn't want to pay some random third party that doesn't own the patent uh, without a uh, affirmation or at least some confirmation that that party owns the patent and has right to grant whatever license or remedy that it is at least seeking monetarily. Uh, moving on, some of the other factors. Um, factor two is prior to sending the demand, the, the asserting entity or the person failed to conduct a, an analysis comparing the claims to the target's products or services or technology. Um, number three, the demand lacks information described in the subsection one we just described above. Again, identity, patent numbers, and information that at least a target could take and make a reasonable uh, uh, um, investigation as to whether there truly is infringement. And then fourth is the, the demand is made with an unreasonably short period of time. So we demand you pay tens of thousands of dollars and we demand that by next week. So that would trigger factor four. Factor five is the actual offer for license in the demand letter is not a reasonable estimate of the value of the license. And we've seen this in instances where certain patent trolls send a demand out to potential targets and the, and the fee for that license is the same across the board, regardless of who the target is and regardless of what the target is doing or the potential uh, volume of infringement. So that would be uh, on its face an unreasonable amount. Um, factor six is going to the heart of some of the baselessness claims or the un, un, um, uh, uh, at least in this instance where the, the claim is meritless that the assertion or the person making that assertion knows or should have known that the assertion is meritless. Um, and then finally, the claim or assertion of patent infringement is deceptive. Uh, so th these are a number of factors that at least are in the act, a court can use to determine whether this is there a bad faith assertion of patent infringement. Um, factor eight, 
if there's subsidiaries or affiliates that are also being sued or threatened to be sued on the same or similar claims of patent infringement. Um, number nine is, is the person making the claim or assertion the same? It's the same demand to multiple recipients. That's uh, similar to one of the factors above is the reasonableness of the amount being asserted and demanded. Factor 10 uh, looks at, you know, the person making the claim is aware of or at least has knowledge of what are called post-grant filings um, or at least other actions involving the same patent. So post-grant filings or post-grant activity is actions before the Patent Trial and Appeal Board that may have found part or whole of that patent invalid. And so it shouldn't be reasonable for that NPE or patent troll to be asserting that patent again here against uh, this target. And then 11 is the person making the claim seeks an injunction when it's objectively unreasonable under the law. So there's no competitive nature. There's no um, irreparable harm that you would normally see in a patent infringement case that would warrant injunctive relief. But yet the patent troll is, is seeking injunctive relief. So these are, again, as I mentioned, a number of factors that are um, considered by the court that are specific, or that may be considered by a court. And then 12, the fact, 12 factor is one that any other factor the court finds relevant. So there's also a list of factors that go against a finding of bad faith assertion. So in the, a, a lot of these mirror the opposite, if you will, of the first 12 factors that do support a finding of bad faith assertion. So the first one being the demand contains the information described in subsection one, as we discussed earlier. There's a whole list of information, the owner of the patents, the specific patents being asserted, the claim chart, more particularly, that shows infringement on a detail claim element by claim element um, level. Um, factor two, at least with regard to the, the um, sub factors where there isn't a bad faith assertion or may not be, is where the demand lacks information in subsection one, but yet that was provided within a reasonable amount of time after requested. Um, Factor three, the person engages in good faith effort to establish that the target is infringed and attempts to negotiate an appropriate remedy. So if the patent troll is engaging and in, in providing information, providing claim charts, providing all the factors in subsection one, as noted above, that might uh, take away from a bad faith assertion factors analysis. Um, if Factor four is implicated in some of the other ones as well. This is an entity that's probably not a patent troll. If they're making substantial investment in the use of the patent or production or sell of the product, that's counter to the definition of a patent troll, the one that doesn't make and use the invention. Patent or, or factor four here does provide that where you do have, albeit maybe a small entity or a startup that is trying to develop the product covered by the patent, then that would aid in their favor to avoid a patent assertion claim under bad faith terms in this act. Um, factor five, person's either an inventor or joint inventor or an institution of higher education. So this is an um, interesting distinction, at least, because you have a lot of universities that aren't necessarily practicing the invention, but they're doing quite a bit of research and quite a bit of investment into the technology and, in most instances, looking for to spin it out into a startup or something similar. Uh, factor six is a person has demonstrated a good faith business practice and previous efforts to enforce the patent, particularly through litigation. So if there's been successes in asserting the patent previously through litigation, and for whatever reason, the entity itself just hasn't been successful that's asserting these patents, it's possibly because these the competition has swallowed up the space for what is this product. And again, these factors conclude just like the prior set of 12 with a catch-all 
So factor seven is any other factor a court may find relevant. So those are the factors, at least with regard to the North Carolina Act, uh, to weigh for or against a bad faith assertion of patent infringement and that might invoke the act here. So these factors are both um, weighed on an objectively baseless standard and a subjectively baseless standard, no different than the analysis that's conducted if there is an exceptional case in defending or asserting a patent infringement case. So first, it must be objectively baseless in the sense that no reasonable litigant could have expected success on the merits in this case. There's no, there's no basis for a claim of infringement, for instance. And the second factor is more to the subjective motivation. And these both of these factors, and I mentioned the Nora Pennington case here because that's relevant given uh, a North Carolina court's ruling on the constitutionality of North Carolina's Abuse of Patent Assertion Act. So with that, we'll, we'll turn to talking to a number of these cases starting here in North Carolina. Um, that was largely the first case that determine substantively the constitutionality of the act. Um, the first case that touched on an act was the landmark, oddly enough, uh, you see landmarks name a number of times in these cases because they are a patent troll and they have been asserting their patent against a number of parties across the country. And so their name comes up at least in three of the cases that I'll mention, the first one of which is in Oregon. So. That Oregon case, um, there was a um, plaintiff here, at least in this instance, Landmark, who sued Azure Farms for violating uh, its patents. And the, the winery is what it is. The Oregon winery invoked the Oregon Act to raise a counterclaim for bad faith infringement claims under the North, or I'm sorry, under the Oregon Act. And there was a um, not a deep substantive dig on this, but a high level assessment by the court that, you know, to the extent that this Oregon Act stands as an obstacle to the accomplishment and executions of Congress because it infer interferes with what is 35 U.S.C. Section 287. That's the that's the um, uh, response, if you will, of for. Um, attorney's fees and exceptional case awards where there's bad faith assertions that all preceded the acts, the state acts I'm describing. Here, at least in Oregon, the court disagreed. And so the, the court didn't dig deep into the substantive arguments raised, um, but found that at least the, the, the claim could proceed. So that was the first case, if you will, that at least touched on um, some substantive issues. Um, the, the next, at least sort of observation in that case was from, uh, the magistrate judge who in her findings and recommendations found that, you know, her observation, the individual bad faith actors are not required, but merely, uh, but are merely issues that a court that may consider as well as any subjective bad faith act. So what the the, at least the magistrate judge in the Oregon case uh, found was that there aren't um, a rigid set of factors. So, so the prior 12 factors we looked at for North Carolina's act, along with the seven that go against a bad faith finding, they're not exclusive and they're not the be all end all. It's not required that all of these be met. And so these, you know, the federal circuit has found that objective and subjective elements of bad faith need not necessarily be written into a statute, but it helps at least where there are a list of factors. And that's that's certainly what Oregon's Act has, including North Carolina's Act. So moving on to North Carolina, the NAPCO, oh, I'm sorry, we've got a... Um, We've got to take our poll. I forgot. So the first polling question we've got is what was the first state to enact an abusive patent assertion act? So I will give everyone some time to answer.
I think we've got about 20 seconds left. And obviously, everyone needs to get their answers in so that they can receive credit, at least those of us who are attorneys seeking CLE credit. Okay. And the correct answer is Vermont, and at least 65% of you got that right, and that's the correct answer. So Vermont was the first act. Uh, or first state that enacted a uh, abusive patent assertion act, um, and we shall move on. So NAPCO, the NAPCO case is here in um, North Carolina. It's still a pending and active case, and in the interest of full disclosure, I'm lead counsel for NAPCO in that case. And unlike the Oregon case where Landmark was a uh, plaintiff here, NAPCO was the plaintiff. So NAPCO brought this case under the North Carolina Abusive Patent Assertion Act after receiving a demand letter insisting upon a $65,000 payment for license to the 508 patent titled Automated Multimedia Data Processing Network. Now, as way of background, uh, the patent was originally filed in 1984. Um, it has since expired, um, but was also invalidated by Judge Schroeder in uh, the Middle District of North Carolina. But patent itself, is, it, it was originated and focused on electronic loan processing back in a time when that was all done on paper. And in fact, the claim eight, which was one of the exemplary claims, notes an automated multimedia system, which comprises one computer station, one means for accepting and processing a user's, user's entry to backward chaining and forward chaining sequences, a term that wasn't defined in the specification of the patent, a means for analyzing and combining user's entry with stored data, means responsive to said means, and, that, and it goes on. So th this patent arguably covered loan processing, and the letter sent to Nap NAPCO asserted that their website, which was a static website, binders.com, that you could go online and, and look for binders and call up the company and order binders, um, was asserted to infringe this patent. And the same letter with the same $65,000 demand was sent to over 200 separate companies, at least at the time uh, of uh, filing in the North Carolina case. And NAPCO, as I alluded to earlier, is a subsidiary of the Vulcan company, and it operates the binders.com website. So NAPCO qualifies as being a target under the act because it's a company that received a demand letter, is a subject of an assertion of or an allegation of patent infringement, and was threatened with litigation relating to such infringement. So after receiving this letter uh, in late 2020, NAPCO filed suit in January of 2021 under the act, including a declaratory judgment claims of uh, patent invalidity and non-infringement of the patent. So Landmark responds with a motion to dismiss, claiming, among other things, that the act itself is unconstitutional. So this is the first substantive dig, if you will, into the constitutionality of the act or any act in, in the country. And at this stage, the um, basis for unconstitutionality were a misapplication of the act, that there's a pleading injury that, that was not a requirement, that it was preempted, and there were multiple preemption arguments, one based upon the objective and subjective bad faith factors that are covered under Section 285, as I mentioned earlier, of the Patent Act. In addition, that it was preempted as a whole under federal patent law. I alluded to that the, the um, act was that there was challenge under Norm Pennington doctrine this basically is a equivalent to a sham thus um NAPCO should have been barred from bringing the claim under the act given the Norm Pennington doctrine 
And there was a First Amendment challenge that it violated uh, Landmark's right to assert its patent. Uh, there was an equal protection challenge that it there was an argument that Landmark was treated differently because, for instance, as I alluded earlier, universities didn't have to follow the same or didn't suffer from the same um, issues as patent trolls under the act, for instance. And then a violation of the Commerce Clause where um, there was a claim by Landmark that it erected a barrier against their ability to engage in interstate trade, even though they Landmark A, that subsidiary of or related company to Landmark in Oregon, in that Oregon case, what is a North Carolina entity. So following Landmark's motion to dismiss, there were several um, amici that weighed in on the, both the act and the, the response to Landmark's motion to dismiss, and that included SAS. Red Hat, Garmin, and, and Kushnet, and many others, but also the Secretary, um, I'm sorry, the North Carolina Attorney General's office weighed in as well with their own separate brief. Now, the Attorney General has the option to either weigh in to defend a North Carolina act or to step in and take part in the case. They chose the former rather than the latter in this instance and have been active, if, if you will, in that in that respect. But follow us, following, as you could expect, multiple rounds of briefing, Judge Schroeder issued his order in August of 21, recognizing that the statute had not been construed by any other court. So there's 30 other states out there that have similar abusive patent assertion acts. And no, none of the um, courts in those states, either state courts or federal courts, had ruled substantively on the constitutionality of those acts. Um, and at least with Judge Schroeder's um, opinion here in North Carolina, he found that, look, this is like yelling fire in a theater. It's, it regulates only against bad faith statements or assertions in in. Uh, you know, or by a non-practicing entity or patent troll, and that's just not protected under the First Amendment. Moreover, just because the Act provides a list of factors that could uh, uh, obviate against a finding of bad faith, that doesn't compel that speech, uh, but it provides just a broad set of factors that a court may consider before making a finding of bad faith. Um, ultimately, in, you know, Determining groups for exclusion, the, he stated the General Assembly attempted to isolate a group that may be undercapitalized and undeterred by the prior legal status quo. The act as written does not appear unreasonable for that, pur for that purpose. And in doing so, denied Landmark's motion to dismiss. This opinion by Judge Schroeder has been cited multiple times since this uh, 2021 decision. And... Moving on, Judge Schroeder, late last year, in August of last year, during a or following a claim construction hearing, found that the patent was invalid. So the original patent that was asserted by Landmark was invalid for indefiniteness, um, largely because there was no link to the specification for many of the elements, particularly what we define in our patent world is called means plus function elements, where you define a means for doing something, and then you have to go dig into the patent to figure out what does that mean? What, what are the means for doing something defined in the patent? And the patent law requires that it be defined with specificity. And in this case, it was not. So this case is still pending um, with only NAPCO's uh, North Carolina Abusive Patent Assertion Act claims remaining. Um, a follow-on case, I say follow-on because this is also a case that has been ongoing here against Landmark is in Washington State. In this case is actually a bit different because what's going on here is here the Attorney General did step in and bring an action against Landmark, finding that Landmark had asserted these same patents against a number of um, residents and uh, companies located in Washington state. So the attorney general brought this action and there was a similar motion to dismiss on very similar grounds filed by um, 
landmark, uh, both in this case and the NAPCO case. And once again, at least this decision comes out after Judge Schroeder's first substantive decision on, on the constitutionality of these acts and found that, you know, the state, Washington, the attorney general is correct that it pled landmark as sending out pre-litigation letters in bad faith and that a jury could easily find bad faith based upon these facts and facts that could plausibly in, be introduced at trial. So um, the Washington Atten Gen Attorney General's office noted there were 1,200 small businesses uh, targeted in Washington state over an 18-month period. Um, I'm sorry, in 48 states over an 18-month period, and a large number of which were in Washington all demanding $65,000 for having a web presence. Um, in fact, there has been some further developments. The, the um, principal of Landmark, Ray Mercado, was added as a necessary party to that case. Their lead counsel withdrew, or at least attempted to withdraw. So there's, there's um, some interesting things to continue watching with the state of Washington v. Landmark case. Um, so let me take on our next uh, poll question, which is which state court first substantively decided the constitutionality of any abusive patent assertion act? So for those needing question, needing uh, CLE credit, please answer the polling question at your convenience. I think we've got about 25 seconds left. All right. So the correct answer to this polling question is North Carolina. Um, looks like we had 43% say Virginia. Um, that's not accurate. It was North Carolina. It was Judge Schroeder in the Middle District of North Carolina who first ruled on the substantive constitutionality of uh, a North Car or a abusive patent assertion act. Um, so moving on, there, there is a more recent couple of cases I'd like to touch on. Um, in fact, there's even further developments that happened uh, since these slides got finished. So I'll have to fill in um, on some of those cases. As you can imagine, this has been a very, very active area and a moving target for a lot of uh, patent trolls. So at least in Georgia, uh, this but the Georgia has its own act. It's got very similar requirements as the North Carolina and Vermont acts. Um, it's Georgia Code 10-1-771. And here, there was a um, declaratory judgment plaintiff who brought a state law claim that asserted that this non-practicing entity made a bad faith assertion of patent infringement in a letter. And the court, in denying the motion to dismiss, found that at least the accused infringer pled sufficient facts that could show a bad faith assertion under, under Georgia's act and denied that motion to dismiss the claim. And here, not, as, not in as much detail, but did also find that there was no federal preemption. So these cases have at least... Um, the the match has been lit by the most recent NAPCO case and Judge Schroeder's finding. Um, the Georgia case and many others have sort of looked to, you know, any state precedent similar to what uh, Judge Schroeder did to find what can we hang our hat on where another court has taken on this issue substantively. Um, 
while Judge Schroeder's opinion was far deeper and far more substantive in that uh, Middle District of North Carolina case um, brought by NAPCO, here, at least from some of the later opinions we've seen, the judges in other district courts are just checking the box and saying, no, there's other courts that have already found that this is um, constitutional, that there's no federal preemption, there's no violation of First Amendment rights, and not having to give you the deep dig that at least Judge Schroeder's lengthy opinion did. So at least for those of us that defend against patent assertion entities or patent troll cases, we find this to be a good sign and frankly a good um, change in tide in our favor to go against some of these um, patent assertion entities. Uh, let's see here. Can you go to the next slide, please? Or in, um... There we go. Okay. Um, another recent case that's caught quite a bit more attention and press is the Katana Silicon Techs case versus Micron Technologies. So this is a District of Idaho case. Um, it actually started in Texas. So originally, there are two patent trolls at issue here. One is Katana, and the other is a, um, I, I believe its owner is Longhorn IP. And so they this case was originally brought in Texas. Micron, based in Idaho, filed its own case in Idaho, raising Idaho's um, bad faith inform enforcement statute. Um, there was a similar, um, gosh, a, a motion to dismiss and motion briefing stage that challenged Idaho's law as well. Um, and in particular, at least what Micron did in this instance was to invoke the bond provision in Idaho. So here, at least the District of Idaho federal judge found that um, federal patent law, once again, doesn't preempt Idaho's bad faith enforcement statute. And again, let me digress for a moment. Most of the analysis, both in Judge Schroeder's opinion and many of the other opinions that even touch on this substantively, recognize that this is more of a unfair competition or, you know, again, uh, unfair and deceptive trade practices type action that states have long been able to, to enact statutes to, to counter. And like my analogy of yelling fire in a theater, it's that not all, not all actions and not all um, speech is protected by the First Amendment, and not all of the remedies available against patent trolls are preempted by federal patent statute. So, generally speaking, the the Federal Circuit precedent, I say the Federal Circuit, that's the Court of Appeals that hears all patent. Uh, appeals from the various district courts based in D.C. has long held that as long as you've got a subjective standard and an objective standard to base this, you know, bad faith assertion of infringement allegations on, then it gen generally coexists with the existing remedies under 35 U.S.C. Section 185 and the Patent Act, which is the bad faith or um, objective unreasonable uh, actions in a patent infringement case. So again, here we've got, you know, a, a uh, the patentee in the Katana case sent a notice, started the three-year statute of limitations regarding assertion of the patent and filing a patent infringement case was not a within the statute of limitations, not a separate violation of the state statute. So at least in this, each time there is an act, whether it's a letter that's sent or a, a complaint that is filed, that that each stand on their own, if you will. So it doesn't force, you know, if the, if the patent troll sends a letter and then waits three years to sue, that doesn't mean that the target is out of a remedy under any of these state law acts. That was one of the findings in Idaho. 
But what's caught more press than anything else and a lot of attention is the bond provision that was invoked. So once, um, once Micron got this case in Idaho and utilized the Idaho statute, similar to North Carolina, there's a bond provision. So you can invoke the bond provision to force the patent troll to put up a bond. Because again, most of these patent trolls or non-practicing entities are shell companies. There's no money on the other end of these entities. And even if you won a case, you know, you, you successfully defeated the patent infringement claim and you got the court to find that the, the case was unreasonable or objectively unreasonable or um, in any of the flavors of Section 285 or under the Act's provisions, a bad faith assertion of infringement, your remedy would generally be to go after the target, I'm sorry, the patent troll for your attorney's fees. Well, if the patent troll has no money, then unfortunately, these targets are left with no recourse. And that was contemplated both at the North Carolina legislature when they enacted North Carolina's Abuse of Patent Assertion Act and among many of the other acts in uh, the various other states. And similarly, in Idaho, they have a bond provision. Now, Idaho's bond provision is different than North Carolina's in a number of respects because it provides that you make a good faith estimate of the cost to litigate that, and you can have that amount trebled. So both at the finality of the case, when you're when you succeeded under a abuse of patent assertion act, and at the beginning of the case or early in the case, if you will, when you want to get the bond. So in in the Katana v. Microtech case, interestingly enough, Micron said, look, it's going to cost us X number of dollars to litigate this case, plus the patent trial and appeal board proceedings where we're trying to invalidate um, Longhorn and Katana's patents. And that amount troubled equates to $15 million. They proceeded with this um, bond motion that got to the court and the court reduced that down to $8 million and granted Micron's request in part for an $8 million award, including a $2 million, a good faith estimate of Micron's cost to litigate these claims and an amount reasonably likely to be recovered and treble damages. This was, this sent shockwaves through uh, the IP litigation bar. And for those of us that fight patent trolls regularly and, and defend against these types of cases. This was a huge win and one sort of weighty hammer, if you will, that, that can be used against a lot of these patent trolls. Now, what's not in these slides and what I can update everyone uh, on the, um, on the uh, panel here in the, in the forum is that two days ago, um, Longhorn, which again is related to Katana, filed their opening Federal Circuit brief, and I have I have read through that brief, and it's quite interesting because they're they're arguing a lot of the similar constitutional arguments that Landmark argued in the Napco case, and in addition, it's arguing that you're essentially having. A, a party have to post a bond to utilize the courts so that it violates their equal protection and the the right to access uh, the court system for their for their um, patent infringement claims, and um, it's interesting. So the Judge Nye is the judge in Idaho that issued that or imposed that eight million dollar bond, and in part of um, um, Katana or Longhorn's brief, they state. Micron no doubt counts Katana to fold up its tent and go home rather than face the prospect of years of litigation in Micron's Idaho hometown on Micron's state law assertion claims seeking quadruple damages while Katana's affirmative federal claim seeking compensation for patent infringement is barred from proceeding absent an $8 million bond. So this is a significant bond that at least at this stage, um, is still being litigated at the federal circuit. And 
given that um, only Katanis slash um, Longhorn have filed their opening brief, we will continue to monitor this and watch to see as this case progresses, because it will likely be the first case case that is substantively addressed at the federal circuit, the, the only court of appeals, if you will, for patent infringement cases, to finally weigh in on, are these acts constitutional? Are the bond provisions constitutional? And then separately, as to um, the Idaho Judge Nye's imposition of an $8 million um, bond, does that pass muster under um, both the, the state law acts and possibly not run afoul of the federal acts? So, again, this is um, it's active, ongoing litigation, so it tends to be a bit of a moving target. But um, that is currently the, the most active case. So, as I noted, it's on appeal to the federal circuit, particularly with regard to the bond. Um, the district court, so Judge Nye also recently stayed all the proceedings pending the appeal and this, um, there's a co-pending PTAB. So PTAB, for those that aren't patent practitioners, that's Patent Trial and Appeal Board. So if you're going to go back to the patent office to try to challenge the validity of any patents, you go before the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And here, um, both of those cases, the district court case that stayed and the PTAB proceedings are, are still pending. And um, at least for the district court case, um, the appeal is ongoing. And I did not put that appeal number in the um, slides because it's still pretty recent. But for those that are really interested, it's case number 23-2007. Um, so that's the Katana case. And that's the one that we're really watching uh, you know, more closely than many of the others. Um, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, coming back to North Carolina, we've got another case that was um, filed here. Again, it was filed by the target, meaning the recipient of the demand, a demand letter, Schaefer Systems, um, who in this instance brought... Um, the, oh, pardon me, brought the declaratory judgment claim against both two parties here. So this is interesting. You've got essentially what is a Texas patentee. So the patentee itself is only based in Texas. It's got a separate Illinois-based licensing representative, an entity that is sending these letters out to various parties demanding uh, you know, remuneration for patent infringement. So Schaefer Systems sues these parties in North Carolina. Now, neither of these, either the Texas Patent Troll or this Illinois-based licensing representative have any contacts, as best as we can tell from the filings, to North Carolina. So usually at least for us, most of us litigators, if we're going to sue someone, we have to establish personal jurisdiction. And the Act, at least the North Carolina Act, does that in part. It provides a basis for any target that receives a letter to avail themselves of the Act and that if the, the target has received this letter, regardless of from where it comes, they can drag these parties into a North Carolina court. Now, that's a somewhat separate or related um, piece of this puzzle, if you will, that hasn't been really challenged and wasn't really invoked. Again, I'll, I'll go back to the, the NAPCO v. Landmark case. Landmark is a North Carolina entity, so they couldn't have raised a, a jurisdictional challenge, right? It, ju it just wasn't going to be at issue. Here, however, you've got a Texas patentee and an Illinois-based licensing representative sending a demand letter, you know, arguably in bad faith, to, I, it's called, I describe it in the slides, a DJ plaintiff. That's a declaratory judgment plaintiff. So that's, if you're threatened with suit and you can, in under certain circumstances, bring a case yourself. So you're almost as if you're the defendant bringing an action against a plaintiff who's asserting patent infringement against you. And in this case, in the Western District of North Carolina, 
the court found that both of these entities, the Texas patentee and the Illinois-based licensing representatives, were subject to suit in this state and subject to jurisdiction because they submit, submitted a demand letter to a target in North Carolina. So this if, if you recall from my earliest slides, North Carolina's act has a couple of unique differences, different from the Vermont Act and some of the other acts, both with respect to the bond, but also to this joinder provision. And here, the jurisdictional piece of it, too, allows that you're essentially, as soon as you're a target, if you're in North Carolina and you've received one of these demand letters, you have to think long and hard about how you're wanting to respond. Because a lot of these parties, particularly where you've got a Texas patentee, they're going to find a way to try to bring a suit in Texas. And there's been a lot of litigation and a lot of mandamus practice, even as late as yesterday, I believe. There was, I think, the 30th mandamus by the Federal Circuit against a court in Texas to remove the case out of Texas because there was no jurisdiction. So um, a lot of these targets are, in essence, having to weigh a decision. Do I bring a lawsuit first? Since I've got this tool, the North Carolina Act, do I bring this action and jump into litigation so it avoids me from having to go to Texas or somewhere else to have to fight this fight? So now, at least following the, the Schaefer Systems case, this provides ammunition for targets to say, we've received a letter, we can drag these folks into a North Carolina courtroom. Um, and it's, I, I'll say, it's not limited to federal courts. So in essence, there is an option and it's contemplated that a state court could hear this act. Now, most of us that litigate patent cases prefer to be in federal court for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is for at least patent infringement claims, it's exclusive jurisdiction in the, in the federal regime. So again, there. This case is ongoing. We're watching this and, and many other cases, including the Idaho Micron case that's up on appeal. And we will, uh, I'm sure, have an update at a later point in time. So that at least gets me to some of the takeaways. I think we're going to have one more poll before we proceed. Here we go. All right. So which court, which state first substantively dis oh, I think that went away. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, we did the prior question. Here's the final question. Uh, I know everybody's about ready to go and we're almost done. So approximately how many states have enacted an abusive patent assertion act? I think we have about 45 seconds, give or take. So for those of you needing credit, Please get your answers in. Got 30 seconds left. All right. The correct answer is more than 30. So there are over 30 states that have an abusive patent assertion act. Again, Vermont started the, the trend. North Carolina closely followed along with Idaho and Georgia and many other states. But we're up to 30 separate states now. Um, so we had a split of roughly 43% of you said 15 and 43% of you said 25. And look, I, I had a conversation with a, um, a litigator on the West Coast recently, and he had never heard of these acts. But it's relatively a new thing, and it's a new tool for uh, those of us that are active at litigating um, cases against non-practicing entities or patent trolls. So 
For the most important part of today's discussion, let's take a look at some of the takeaways. So, hold on. So, if you are in receipt of one of these demand letters, and again, I, I apologize in advance, a lot of these letters are very vague. They don't give a lot of specifics. They may come in and say, you're infringing on our patents based upon your website activity or because you have a photocopier in your office or because of some other things. There have been some pretty egregious, ridiculous patent trolls in the, in the country, again, taking near $30 billion away from the economy every year. Um, but when you get one of these letters in, particularly those of us that are that are attorneys, you need to go through the letter to see, does it fall within the state act? Are, are the elements implicated? You know, is the patentee listed? Are the patent numbers listed? Do you have a claim chart? Does the ownership information mirror up with the actual um, information provided at the USPTO's website, the US Patent and Trademark Office's website. So these are things that you, you have to start looking at whenever one of these letters comes in demanding you know, a royalty or fee for, for a patent license. And then once we get these letters in, my, my office will take a look at all the cases involving, involving the same patents, involving the same parties. I put MPEs here, non-practicing entities. There may be related parties in a lot of cases, and at least with Judge Connolly's court in Delaware, there's been a number of shell entity games and, and actions going on. In fact, Judge Connolly just ordered uh, Attorney Remy and the local counsel in Delaware to show up to his courtroom in person because of some of these um, questionable acts. And at least with the, those disclosure rules, Delaware is um, clamping down on, on some of these activities. Um, so you look for similar cases. You look for cases both at the district court level and at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Um, and generally, you look for a short timeline if they want, to, want a payment in a short period of time. So in any of these, you start invoking the hack, you have to start moving quickly. And you need to either shore up the claims or file an action pretty early under the state act. Um, and I say that because, again, if there wasn't a claim chart provided, for instance, you may want to ask for information or you may want to ask for detail on ownership. And again, under the act, if that information isn't provided in a reasonable amount of time, then that's that's going to be a problem for the patent troll and an advantage for you under the act to use that as a factor in your favor. Um, but when, you know, if it comes time to bring an action, my recommendation is move early for a bond. Invoke the bond provision. That's what it's there for. Um, more particularly, look for any necessary principles of the patent troll. You may not know that at the outset. You may garner some of that information through the, some of the other um, litigation involving the same uh, patent trolls or the similar patents at issue. Um, but either way, even it, with early discovery, if you if you took some expedited discovery at the beginning of the case, one of those pieces of information you're going to want to drill down to is who are the people behind this patent troll? And then, again, if you've, you're in receipt of one of these demands, you have to decide where you're going to file because you do have the option of going um, with federal court or with state court. So those are things to consider. We work on these matters quite a bit. We have um, handled a number of matters involving the North Carolina Abuse of Patent Assertion Act and uh, assisted with other filings and cases involving other states' acts. So we've got quite a bit of experience in this field. Um, and I think that we are done right on time as well. <laughs>